Why is action related to global warming so urgent? In this, our final section, we'll be discussing the planet's inertia, as well as climate feedbacks and tipping points. To this point, we've noted that carbon dioxide is a primary driver of the Earth's vital greenhouse effect, and that human activities have pushed CO2 levels to their highest point in 650,000 years, and at an unprecedented rate. We also noted that, despite considerable natural mechanisms working in opposition, both CO2 and temperature levels have continued to rise, and that these increased levels are reflected in multiple natural indicators around the world. But why is action to reduce carbon emissions so urgent? The answer begins with discussing inertia. A pot of water doesn't boil immediately once heat is applied, nor does that water cool down immediately once the heat is removed. The same principle applies to the climate system. The impacts of a climate forcing are not always felt immediately, but rather over time as the system reacts. As a result, even if all emissions halted immediately, the effects of current and previous emissions that have accumulated in the, in the climate system would continue to be felt for decades. Think about a train. A small forcing continually applied slowly starts the train moving forward, gradually overcoming the forces of weight and friction working in opposition. Building momentum, the train slowly accelerates until it gets up to speed. Now imagine that the train has no brakes. Even if the accelerating force is removed, the train will continue on for a very considerable distance, propelled by its own momentum. In addition to its inertia, the climate system contains feedback mechanisms. Feedbacks are natural responses to a condition that can either amplify that condition or diminish it. Amplifying feedbacks are called positive, while diminishing ones are called negative. Increased temperatures as a result of human carbon emissions can encounter both positive and negative feedbacks. As we discussed earlier, the ability of warmer air to hold more water vapor than colder air can enhance the greenhouse effect even further. It can also result in more clouds, which can trap more heat near the Earth's surface. As ice melts around the world, it also releases any gases trapped within that ice, including additional greenhouse gases. And, as this very reflective ice melts, it leaves behind underlying land masses and ocean waters that absorb much more heat than the lost ice. Working in opposition, the ocean is absorbing greater amounts of carbon dioxide at the cost of increasing oceanic acidity. Additional plant growth also removes greater amounts of CO2 from the atmosphere, providing an additional buffer for human emissions. And while increased cloud cover can trap additional heat, it can also increase the Earth's reflectivity and promote cooling temperatures. But some of these feedback mechanisms, both positive and negative, have limits beyond which they can either kick into overdrive or even switch from negative to positive. These limits are called tipping points. Once one or more tipping points are crossed, self-sustaining changes on an immense scale become inevitable. The absorption of CO2 by the world's forests, the lungs of the planet, provides a massive cushion to emissions from human sources. But what happens if that uptake of carbon dioxide slows, or even reverses? Enabled by warmer winters to flourish, bark beetles have infested over 700,000 acres of forest in southern Wyoming. However, the epidemic may finally be slowing. The insects have simply run out of trees to attack. As the trees die and decay, the CO2 they contain is returned to the atmosphere. Since it began in 1996, the bark beetle infestation across Colorado and southern Wyoming has impacted 3.6 million acres in that region alone. In British Columbia, the epidemic has impacted over 35 million acres, turning the trees from carbon sinks to carbon sources. The equatorial rainforests are also susceptible. In 2005, as Hurricane Katrina made landfall in the U.S., the Amazon rainforest was enduring its worst drought in recorded history. A study found that half of the rainforest areas researched switched to emitting up to 12 times as much carbon per year as they were absorbing before the drought. In addition to the world's forests, the Earth's oceans serve as a huge carbon sink. The colder the ocean water, the more carbon dioxide it can absorb from the atmosphere. So the massive and frigid southern ocean surrounding Antarctica is a primary buffer for human carbon emissions. But, like the forests, these oceanic sinks have limits, and at least two studies, both published in 2007, 
found the sinks provided by both the Southern Ocean and the North Atlantic to be slowing. As we covered earlier, methane is 20 times more powerful in its greenhouse abilities than CO2, and around the world in the northern latitudes, huge stores of the gas are trapped inside of frozen permafrost. The National Snow and Ice Data Center defines permafrost, or permanently frozen ground, as soil, sediment, or rock that remains at or below zero degrees Celsius for at least two years. Homes and roads are built on it. But apparently permanence is no longer a given, as permafrost around the world is showing significant signs of melting. As the permafrost melts, it releases its stored methane back into the atmosphere. And 55 million years ago, a huge change happened very, very fast in geologic terms in the global climate. Temperatures spiked by several degrees in just a few thousand years. The event is called the Paleoeocene Thermal Maximum, or PETM. A leading theory as to the cause of the PETM is that there was a massive release of methane from reserves on the ocean floor as ocean waters warmed. Considering the immense amounts of methane in natural reserves around the planet, the PETM provides a crucial example of the climatic impact of large-scale changes in atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. So why is action related to curbing our carbon emissions so urgent? As they absorb greater amounts of human carbon emissions, the chemistry of the world's oceans is being fundamentally altered, posing a massive threat to oceanic food chains and the human populations that rely on them. The Earth's climate also does not stop on a dime. Changes driven by human actions have momentum in the climate system, and the full impact of our actions today will not be completely reflected in the global climate for years to come. This momentum can carry the climate system across multiple tipping points, beyond which natural feedback mechanisms will drive the global climate to extreme conditions while making any human actions toward mitigation largely irrelevant. All of human society is predicated on climate predictability. This consistency in the climate dictates where we live, how we grow our food, and where we get our water. As this predictability is lost, the human cultures that rely on it will be drastically impacted, but it's not just human civilization that is dependent on climate predictability. It's animal and plant species as well. Some species are able to adapt or migrate based on environmental changes. But as we've seen in the microcosm of oceanic dead zones, other species are not able to adapt fast enough and will die as a result. As species die, food chains that depend on them can collapse as well. And we're seeing signs of these changes already in increasing oceanic acidification, massive forest infestations, droughts and glacier loss that impact food and water availability, and the loss of species confined by their surroundings. The following is a list of organizations throughout the scientific community from around the world that acknowledge the global impact of rising atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations from human activities. The list is not exhaustive, but represents organizations that have either issued a singular statement of their own or signed an agreement to a collective statement regarding the anthropogenic impact of rising emissions on global climate and the global biosphere. All statements have been issued since 2001. The list covers organizations that span every continent on the planet. Finally, here are some additional resources to continue your own research on the topics of global warming and climate change.